We're back in the Big Apple, theCUBE's coverage of MongoDB World 2022. Sahir Azam is here, he's the Chief Product Officer of MongoDB, and Guillermo Rausch is the CEO of Vercel. Hot off the keynotes from this morning, guys, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here. Guillermo, yeah, thanks for having us. Guillermo, when it comes to, to modern web development, you know, the back end, the cloud guys got it kind of sewn up, you know? <laughs> Forget about but, it. But you know, all the action's <laughs> in the front end, and that's where you are. Explain Vercel. Yeah, so Vercel is the company that pioneers front-end development as serverless infrastructure. So we built Next.js, which is the most popular React framework in the world. This is what front-end engineers choose to build innovative UIs, beautiful websites. Companies like Dior and GitHub and TikTok and Twitch, which we mentioned in the keynote, uh, are powering their entire .coms or all of their new parts of their .coms with Next.js. And Vercel is the serverless platform where you, you can deploy frameworks like Next.js and others like Svelte and, and Vue to uh, create really fast experiences on the web. So here, so serverless, I hear that's the hot trend. <laughs> you guys made some announcements today. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the, we have spending data with our friends at ETR right down the street. I mean, it's just off the charts, whether it's Amazon, Google, uh, Azure right. Functions, I mean, it's just exploding. Yeah, it's, uh, I think in many ways it's a natural trend. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about, in the, whether it be t today's keynote or another industry, uh, talks you see around our industry that developers are constantly looking for ways to focus on innovation and the business logic that defines their application and the, as opposed to managing the plumbing and ma you know, management of infrastructure. And we've seen this happen over and over again across every layer of the stack. And so for us, you know, at MongoDB, we have a bit of you know, sort of a lens of a broad spectrum of the market. We certainly have you know, large enterprises that are modernizing existing kind of core systems, but then we have developers all over the world who are building the next big best thing, and that's what led us to partner with Vercel, is just the bleeding edge of developers building in a new way, in a much more efficient way, and we wanted to make sure we provide a data platform that fits naturally in the way they want to work. So explain to our audience the trade-offs of serverless and, and I want to get into sort of how you resolve that. And then I want to hear from Guillermo what it means for developers. Yeah, in, in our case, we don't view it as an either or. There are certain workloads and definitely certain companies that will gravitate towards a more traditional database infrastructure where they're choosing the configuration of their cluster, they want full control over it. And that provides, you know, certain benefits around cost predictability or isolation and or perceived benefits at least of those things and customers will gravitate towards that. Now on the flip side, if you're building a new application or you want the ability to scale seamlessly and not have to worry about any of the plumbing, serverless is clearly the easier model. So over the long term, we certainly expect to see as a mix of things, more and more serverless workloads being built on our platform and just generally in the industry, which is why we leaned in so heavily on investing in Atlas Serverless. But the flexibility to not be forced into a particular model, but to get the same database experience across your application and even switch between them is an important characteristic for us as we build going and forward. And you stress the, the cost efficiency mm -hmm. uh, and not having to worry about you know, starting cold. Yep. Um, you've architected around that. What does that mean for a, a, a developer? For a developer it means that you kind of get the best of both worlds, right? Like you get the best possible performance. Front-end developers are extremely sensitive to this. That's why us pioneering this concept of serverless front-end has put us in a very privileged position because we have to deliver that really quick time to first buy, that really quick paint. So any of the old trade-offs of serverless are not accepted by the market. You have to be extremely fast, you have to be instant to deliver that front-end content. So what we talked about today, for example, with the Vercel Edge Network, we're removing all of the cost of that like, first hit that cold start doesn't really exist, and now we're seeing it all across the board going, going into the back end where Mongo has also gotten rid of it. How do you guys collaborate? What's the focus of integration specifically from you know, an engineering resource standpoint? Sure. Yeah, main, the main idea is idea to global app in seconds, right? You have your idea, uh, we give you the framework. We don't give you infrastructure primitives. We give you all the necessary tools to start your application. Um, in practice, this means you host it in a, in a Git repo, you import it onto Vercel, you install the Mongo integration, now your front end and your data back end are connected. And then your application just goes global in, in seconds. So, okay, so you've, you've abstracted away the complexity of those primitives, is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Do, do developers ever say, that's awesome, 
But I'd like to get to them every now and then, or, or, or do you not allow that? Definitely, the, we, yeah. we expose all the underlying APIs, and the, and the key thing we hear is that, especially with the, with the push for usage-based billing models, observability is of the essence. So at any time, you have to be able to query in real time every data point that the platform is observing. We give you performance analytics in real time to see how your front end is performing. We give you statistics about how often you're querying your back end and so on, and your cache hit ratios. So what I talked about today in the keynote is, it's not just about throwing more compute at the problem, but the ability to use the edge to your advantage to memoize computation and reuse it across different visits. When we think of mission critical historically, you know, you think about going to your ATM, right? I mean, a financial sure. transaction. <laughs> But Mongo uh, is positioning for mission critical applications across a variety of industries. Do we yep. need to rethink what mission critical means? I think it's all in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. If you're a new business starting up, your software and your application is your entire business. So if you have a cold start latency, or God forbid something actually goes down, you don't have a business. So it's just as mission critical to that founder of a new business and new technology as it is, you know, in a established enterprise that's running sort of a more you know, day-to-day -day application that we may all interact with. So we treat all of those scenarios with equal fervor and importance, right? And many times, it's a lot of those new experiences that are the, become the day-to-day -day experiences for us globally and are super important and we power all of those, whether it be an established enterprise all the way to the next big startup. I, I often talk about COVID as the forced march to digital, mm -hmm. which was obviously a little bit rushed, uh, but if you weren't a digital business, you were out of business, yep. and so now you're seeing people step back and say, all right, let's be more thoughtful about our, our digital transformation. We've got some time, we, we've obviously learned some things, made some mistakes. It's all about the customer experience, though, and that becomes yep. mission critical, yes. right? What are you seeing, Guillermo, in terms of the, the patterns in digital transformation now that we're sort of exiting the isolation economy? One thing that comes to mind is we're seeing that it's, it's not always predictable how fast you're going to grow in this digital economy. So we have customers in the e-commerce space, they do a drop, and they're piggybacking on serverless to give them that ability to instantly scale. And they couldn't even prepare for some of these events. We see that a lot with the Web3 space and NFT mm -hmm. drops, where they're building in such a way that they're not sensitive to this massive fluctuations in traffic, they're taking it for granted. We put in so much work together behind the scenes to support it, but the digital native creator just, oh, things are scaling from one second to the next, like I'm hitting like 20,000 requests per second, no problem, Vercel is handling it. But the amount of infrastructure work that's gone behind the scenes to support this has been incredible. We see that in gaming all the time. You know, it's really hard for a gaming company to necessarily predict where in the globe a game's going to be particularly hot. Games get super popular super fast if they're <laughs> successful. It's really yeah. hard to predict. It's another vertical that's you know, got a similar dynamic. So gaming, crypto, so you're saying, you're saying that, that you're able yeah. to assist your customers in architecting so that the website doesn't crash, but at Absolutely. the same time, if the, the, the business dynamic changes, yeah. they can dial down. And yeah. yeah, right, and in many ways, slow is the new down, right? And, and if somebody has a slow yeah. experience, they're going to leave your site just as much as if it's I'm out of here. down. So, <laughs> right. you know, it's really maintaining that, that really fast performance, that amazing customer experience, because this is all measured, it's scientific. Like, any time there's friction in the process, you're going to lose customers. Yep. So obviously people are excited about your, your keynote, but what have they been saying? Any specific comments you can, you can share? or Questions that you got that were really interesting? Or? I'm already getting links to the apps that people are deploying. So the whole <laughs> idea of ITA to go all over the world. <laughs> yeah, so it's already working. So they, were they were showing off, look yeah, what I did, on really. Twitter, yeah. That's uh, amazing. <laughs> I think from my standpoint, um, I, I got a question earlier. With the, we were with, uh, with a bunch of financial analysts mm -hmm. and investors, and. They said they've been talking to a lot of the customers in the halls and just to see you know, from the last time we were all in person, the number of our customers that are using multiple capabilities across this idea of a developer data platform. You know, Certainly MongoDB has been a popular core database, open source for a long time, but the new capabilities around search, analytics, mobile being adopted much more broadly to power these experiences is the most exciting thing from our side. Uh, so, okay, so from 2019 to now, you're talking, you're saying substantial uptick in, in ad adoption for these features? Um, yeah, and many of them are new. So they series yes, as well, that's absolutely. pretty new, so yeah. Yeah, and you know, our philosophy of development at MongoDB is to get capabilities in the hands of customers early, get that feedback to enrich and drive that product market fit. And over the last three years, especially, we've been transitioning from 
a single product, kind of core, you know, non-relational modern database to a data platform, a developer data platform that adds more and more capabilities to power these modern applications. And a lot of those were released during the pandemic. Certainly we talked about them in our virtual conferences and all the Zoom meetings we had over the years, but to actually go talk to all these customers is the largest conference we've ever put on and uh, to get a sense of, wow, all the amazing things they're doing with them. It's definitely a different feeling when we're all together. So that's interesting, when you have such a, a, a hot product, product-led growth, which is mm -hmm. what Mongo has been, and you add these new, new features, you're, they're, uh, they're coming from the developers right, who are saying, hey, we need this. Okay, yep. so you have a pretty high degree of confidence, but how do you know when you have product market fit? I mean, is it adoption, usage, renewals? What's your metric? Yeah, I think it's a mix of quantitative measures that mm -hmm. you know around conversion rates, the size of your funnel, the retention rate, uh, NPS, which obviously can mm -hmm. be measured, but also just qualitative. You know, when you're talking to a developer or a technology executive around what their needs are, and then you see how they actually apply it to solve a problem, it's that balance between the qualitative and the quantitative measurement of things. And you can just sort of, frankly, you can feel it. You can see it in the numbers, sure, but you can kind of feel that excitement. You can see that adoption and what it empowers people to do. And so, to me, as a product leader, it's always a blend of those things. If you get too obsessed with pure, purely the metrics, you can always over-optimize something for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. So you have to bring in that qualitative feedback to balance yourself out. Right. What, what, what Gamer? What do you? What's next? What do you not have that you want? From. From, so, from Sahir and Mongo. So the, the natural next step for serverless computing is is the edge. Mm -hmm. So we have to be. Uh, auto, we have to auto scale, we have to tolerate failures, we have to be available, we have to be easy, but we have to be global. And right now, we've been doing this by using a lot of techniques like caching and, and replication and things like this, but the future is about personalizing even more to each visitor depending on where they are. So if I'm in New York, I want to get the latest offers for New York on demand just for me and using AI to continue to personalize that experience. So giving the developer these tools in a way where it feels natural to build an application like this. It doesn't feel like, oh, I'm going to do this year 10 if I make it. I'm going to do it since the very beginning. Okay, interesting. So that says to me that I'm not going to make a round trip to the cloud necessarily for that experience. Right. I'm going to have some kind of Apple today at the developer, Worldwide Developer Conference announced yep. the M2. Mm -hmm. right? yes, I'm looking at yes. the M1 Ultra and I'm going, wow, look at that. And so you were talking it. about that new one backstage. Right? Before, like, I mean, it's an amazing <laughs> pace of, yes. of silicon yes. development and they're focusing on the NPU, and you look yeah. at what Tesla's doing, I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah. So you're going to have some new hardware architecture that emerges. Most of the AI that's done today is, is modeling in the cloud. Mm -hmm. You're going to have in real-time inferencing at the edge, yeah. so that's not going to do the round trip. There's going to be a data store there, I think it has to be, you're going to persist some of the data, maybe mm -hmm. not all of it, so it's a whole new architecture that's, that's yeah. developing. That's, that's exactly right. That sounds very disruptive. Yeah. Um, how do you think about that and how does Mongo yeah. play there? Uh, Guillermo first. What please. I spend a lot of time thinking about is obviously the developer experience, giving the programmer a programming model that is natural, intuitive, and produces these great results. So if they have to think about data that's local because of regulatory reasons, for example, how can we le let the framework guide them to success? I'm just writing an application, I deploy to the cloud, and then everything else is figured out. Yeah, or, or, or speed of light is another challenge. <laughs> right? yeah. How can, how can yeah. we overcome yeah. the speed right. of light so, is our so next yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're sure. working on yeah. that, aren't you? You got the best <laughs> engineers on that front. <laughs> yeah. We can solve a lot of problems, so, I'm not sure that. So <laughs> Mongo yeah. plays in that scenario, or? Yeah, so I think absolutely, you know, we've been focused heavily on becoming the globally distributed cloud data layer, the back-end data layer that allows you to persist data, to align with performance and move data where it needs to be globally or deal with data sovereignty, data nationalism that's starting to rise. But absolutely, there is more data being pushed out to the edge to your point around processing or inference happening at the edge and there's going to be a globally distributed front end layer as well where their data and processing takes apart. And so we're focused on one, making sure the data connectivity in the layer is all connected into one unified architecture. We do that in combination with technologies that we have that do with mobility or edge distribution and synchronization of data with Realm, and we do it with partnerships. Mm -hmm. We have edge partnerships with AWS and Verizon, we have partnerships with a lot of CDN players who are building out that ed edge platform and making sure that MongoDB is either connected to it or just driving that synchronization back and forth. I, I call that unified experience super cloud. Uh, Robbie Belson from Verizon <laughs> calls it the cloud continuum, yeah, but that, that consistent continuum. experience yep. for developers, whether you're yeah, on-prem, whether you're in 
you know, Azure, Google, AWS, yes. and, and ultimately the Edge. That's the big that's where it's going. white space yeah, right now here in Guillermo, right? It, I think it'll define the next generation of how software is built. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing this some, almost like a collision course between some of the ideas that the Web3 developers are excited about, which is like decentralization yeah. almost to the extreme. But the Web2 also needs more decentralization because we're seeing it with like, the data needs to be local to, to me. I need more privacy. I was yeah. looking at the latest encryption features in Mongo. Like, I think both Web2 needs to incorporate more of the ideas of Web3 and vice versa mm -hmm. to create the best possible consumer experience. Privacy matters more than ever before. Latency for conversion matters more than ever before. And regulations are changing. Yeah. And, and you right. talked about Web3 earlier, talking about new protocols, a, a new distributed you know, system, decentralized system emerging. New hardware architectures. I, I really believe, we really think that, that new economics are going to bleed back into the data center. And, and you know, every 15 years or so, this industry gets disrupted. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, you ain't seen nothing yet, <laughs> guys. <laughs> we all talked about commoditized, hardware becoming commoditized 10, 15 years yeah, ago. Of course. Because of virtualization. It's like, right. nope, not at all. Yeah, <laughs> it's right? actually a lot of innovation right. happening. And the lower the price, yeah. the, the, the more the, yeah. the consumption. So guys, thanks so much. Great conversation. Thank you. Really Thank appreciate you. your time. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the conversation. All right, and thanks for watching. Keep it right there. We'll be back with our next segment right after this short break. Dave Vellante for theCUBE's coverage of MongoDB World 2022.